I'm Chris Cuomo, in for Piers. Welcome to our viewers in the United States and around the world. I also want to welcome my studio audience. Welcome all of you to Syria in Crisis, a live town hall special. This is your chance to ask questions and tell us what you think. We've got a power pack panel of experts here, and we want your questions. You can tweet them, use my name, at Chris Cuomo, try the hashtag, at Syria Questions. Use that hashtag, we'll do that. Now, tonight is going to be all about laying out Americans' concerns, putting them on the table, and getting as much information and analysis as we can on the important decision of whether or not to bomb Syria. So the first thing we need to know is how we got here. So remember, March 2011, in the wake of the Arab Spring, violence starts in Syria after a group of teens and children are arrested for writing political graffiti. Dozens of people are killed when security forces crack down on demonstrations, sparking what we now know as a civil war. August 20th, 2012, another flashpoint. President Obama says this about potential U.S. involvement. Red line for us is we start saying a whole bunch of chemical weapons moving around or being utilized. Uh, that would change my calculus. That would change my equation. Okay, so that was the now infamous red line statement. That takes us to August 21st, 2013. The heartbreaking pictures surface. Rows of dead children. Estimates of lives lost exceed 1,300. That takes us to August 23rd, 2013. We at CNN are the first to interview President Obama about the situation, and he is very cautious, very reluctant to commit the U.S. to another conflict. We are already in communications with the entire international community. We're moving through the UN to try to prompt better action from them. And we've called on the Syrian government to allow an investigation of the site because UN inspectors are on the ground right now. The tone decidedly calm and deliberate. I know because I was the one asking them the questions. However, within days, the president, remember, the president won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009 for his, quote, extraordinary efforts to strengthen international diplomacy and cooperation between peoples. The president changes his tone and says he intends to punish the Assad regime by bombing. He calls on allies but hits a major roadblock on August 29th when the British Parliament votes 285 to 272 not to authorize British military forces to join in strikes on Syria. Takes us to August 31st, 2013. President Obama announces he will seek congressional approval for strikes on Syria. And just yesterday, the president said this. Tim, I didn't set a red line. The world set a red line. The world set a red line when governments representing 98% of the world's population said uh, the use of chemical weapons are abort and passed a treaty forbidding their use even when countries are engaged in war. Congress set a red line when it ratified that treaty. Now, we've got a lot to get to tonight, but we want to begin with the latest perspective from the administration. It is their job to make the case to Americans and to the Congress. So here's the latest from the White House. Joining us now, Tony Blinken, Deputy National Security Advisor to President Obama. Mr. Blinken, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Chris. Now, there are a lot of considerations, obviously, that are causing reluctance in the country, in the United States, and around the world. Uh, one of the major ones is the nature of what's being called the intelligence of the situation, that chemical weapons were used and that it was the Assad regime that used them. I want to play you something uh, that uh, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld said to me on, on New Day. Take a listen to this, and then I'd like you to explain it for me. Take a listen. If intelligence were a fact, it would be called a fact and not intelligence. Do you agree with that statement, Mr. Blinken, that when it comes to a national security, intelligence is not necessarily a fact? Well, look, there are two things going on here. Um, there are intelligence assessments, and assessments are pulling together uh, what we know, that is, facts, and then trying to understand what they mean. And so an assessment, you know, by definition, is someone's uh, best uh, understanding of what the facts mean. But there are lots of facts here uh, that uh, make up this case. And uh, we know, and we've released unclassified intelligence over the last week, uh, we know uh, that uh, rockets were launched from an area controlled by the uh, Syrian government. We know they landed in an area that was controlled by the opposition. Uh, we know that there was an explosion of social media coming out contemporaneous with the attack, uh, with people uh, demonstrating the symptoms of a chemical weapons attack. We now have, uh, from uh, analysis that was done of soil 
and blood and hair uh, that uh, sarin uh, was used. Uh, and uh, we have intelligence uh, of conversations uh, among key players in the Assad regime uh, acknowledging uh, that this happened. So when you put all of that together, uh, now some of this uh, we've had to go to Congress in a classified setting and give them all the details. They're the people's representatives. They have to make that judgment uh, for the people. But a lot of this we've been able to put out in public. And what's, uh, what's really striking, Chris, is the public information on this, especially the social media that was contemporaneous with the attack, whether it was Facebook, Twitter, uh, videos that came out is overwhelming and actually I don't think there's a lot of doubt around the world about whether chemical weapons were used and that Assad used them. Mr. Blinken, clearly there has to be doubt. I mean you're hearing it from the Russian president, uh, you hear it from communities abroad. I mean let me just ask it to you simply. Can you guarantee that chemical weapons were used and they were used by the Assad regime? Gar the, the intelligence community, no one's going to no one's going to guarantee, use the word guarantee, they're going to tell you well, and I'm going to tell you. Why would you attack then? Why, if that's because, the basis for your attack, why, why would you attack if you can't if even you, guarantee the basis? Because we, we, because we believe beyond a reasonable doubt, let me use that standard that's familiar uh, to a lot of people, uh, that beyond a reasonable doubt that the Assad regime used chemical weapons against its own people. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. The case is clear, it's compelling, uh, it's based on intelligence, it's based on facts, it's based on a lot of public information. Mr. Blinken, these are tough questions. Thank you for answering them. Uh, you know how much it matters. That's why I'm chasing you about it. But thank you for giving Appreciate us the it. opportunity. Thanks a lot, Chris. Beyond a reasonable doubt, a standard we have in the United States of America, because it is better to let 100 guilty men go free than to punish one innocent man, right? However, is it a good enough standard for when you're deciding whether or not to bomb? Show of hands here so far. Beyond a reasonable doubt, is that enough? Who thinks that's enough of a standard? Hands up. Anybody else? So just to start the night, who so far feels that we know enough that there's enough proof on the ground for the United States to make a decision to bomb? Who feels confident at this point? Okay. Let's start off now. This is as little about me as possible, as much about you. So we want to get our first question. Mr. Jordan Valentine, what is your question? Obama has taken the issue to Congress. Will he get the votes he needs? Okay. Will he get the votes he needs? Who better to answer that than members of Congress? Let's bring in two members right now. They're from opposite parties, but neither is sold on Syria. Joining us now, Republican Congressman Jason Chaffetz. He's a member of the Homeland Security Committee. Also joining me, Representative Janice Hahn, a Democrat. Thanks to both of you. You heard the question uh, from Jordan. Did you? I'll take it as a yes. Yes, yes. I heard the question. All right, yes. I'll, I'll answer for I'll take it as a yes. Here's what we know so far. The soft vote count in the House, 23 yes 109 no, uh, 20 unknown, and 281 undecided. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Congressman Chaffetz. Uh, in the Senate, by the way, if you want to know that, Jason, it's 24 yes, 18 no, 58 undecided. So that's where we roughly are in, in Congress. But let me ask you, uh, Congressman Chaffetz, uh, you tweeted the following. So far, about 500 emails regarding Syria. 499 say no, and one says yes. Right now, you're both likely no votes. Uh, British intelligence now has proof that sarin gas was used. Do you believe the case has been made for you that there's a legitimate basis to go to war? Are you still a no? Uh, I'm still a no at this point. We're talking about going to war. And if there is a clear and present danger to the United States, then of course I want the president to attack swiftly and decisively. But in this case, I see no present, uh, clear and present danger to the United States. It's an awful, terrible situation. It is a civil war. And I think we also have an obligation, Chris, to consider... Then what happens? If we start bombing another kid, a country and we start killing people in Syria, then what happens in what is truly a powder keg situation with neighbors that don't like each other and then suddenly we have U.S. servicemen and women with their lives on the line? I, I just, I don't know that the case has been made yet. Well, Representative Hahn, let me uh, attack the basis of my own question. I said war. The White House says this is not about war. This is a limited attack. There is going to be no reprisal. They don't believe the Syrians will attack. They don't believe anybody else will attack. Why isn't that giving you comfort? If this is your party we're talking that about. This is your president's party. This is not giving me any comfort, and it's interesting. I think this is the first time Jason and I may be agreeing on something. Uh, but the case has not been made to me that this war has anything to do uh, with us, and it is so unpredictable and we do not know after we have the first strike uh, what is going to be next. Uh, it could explode. They could retaliate against us, against Israel, uh, against our embassies. Uh, this is not a war that I believe 
uh, we should be uh, dragged into. And by the way, my constituents as well, overwhelmingly, are saying absolutely no to dragging us into another foreign war. Now, whether it's right or wrong, though, your constituents don't know what you know, right? Senator Dianne Feinstein made that point. She's chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and she said, well, boy, my constituents are against me, but they don't know what I know. Because you have extra information, why isn't that giving you comfort that there's a legitimate basis for this attack and that it will be limited in scope, no boots on the ground, in and out? Well, I, I, well Chris, if I could jump Jason, in here. Jason, Jason go ahead. Uh, I, I, sorry. Uh, look, that's the concern is those that have looked at the intelligence, they are split. I don't think this is conclusive. You don't see the Intelligence Committee, for instance, in the House, unanimously supporting this at this time. Uh, I, I don't think there, the questions have been answered. Of course, we have the greatest military might in the, in the entire world. If we're going to go to war, then we go with everything and fight to win. But the president has not explained what steps two, three, and four are, uh, what the other ramifications are, and that is simply not good enough. We can't just send a Hallmark card and lob in a few missiles and say, hey, we're punishing you for using sarin gas. That's not good enough okay. in this in this sarin. Okay, but Representative Hahn, here's the other case, though. America looks weak. The president said that there was a line. The line has been crossed. And if you do not take steps now, others will follow. And you saw the human cost on the ground. There were too many kids, and they were killed in one of the worst ways that we know it has to stop. America is uniquely positioned to stop it, and that is the mandate. Well, personally, I don't think we look weak uh, when we uh, choose to not uh, return violence with violence. I think America could look a lot stronger right now if we charted a new course for ourselves. And instead of using this energy to bomb Syria and have these uh, collateral damage and unintended consequences, why don't we use our strength and our might to bring together the international community uh, in diplomacy uh, and finding another way to hold Assad accountable. I think we would be a greater country uh, if we took care of our problems here at home, uh, if we invested more in our own schools, and our own bridges and roads, uh, and, and really helped uh, people recover uh, in this bad economy. So I think that's what would make this country strong. Final question to both of you. Is there anything that will change your mind on this situation between now and the vote? Representative Chase, David? Yeah. Yeah, of course. I'm going to keep an open mind. I'm leaning no. I want to hear the, the best intelligence that we have right up until the time we vote. Um, it is important that the United States of America do the right thing. But I'm not there to just, you know, pass off what the political establishment says. My job is to represent the people of Utah. And right now, we're just not convinced. Representative Hahn? I don't think so. Uh, I've seen all the evidence. I've read the classified documents. Uh, and I don't believe there's anything at this point will, that will convince me uh, to vote in favor of military force at this time. No crisis. Only, no if crisis. I can, only if I could be shown that we have explored all other diplomatic opportunities. When you see the pictures of those kids, though, there's no crisis of conscience? Oh, those were horrible pictures. I, look, I'm a mother. I'm a grandmother. Uh, but I'll tell you, if we have a limited military strike, what's to say that we are not going to also kill uh, some innocent civilians? And there may be a dad that doesn't come home or a brother that doesn't come home uh, or a son that doesn't come home. I, I don't believe uh, we should return violence with violence. This is, uh, we talk about a lot of votes being tough. This is a vote that actually is very difficult. Uh, for all of the most important reasons. Representatives Chaffetz and Han, thank you very much for joining us. Good luck going forward. All right, so we heard from representatives. We heard from the White House. We heard from some of you so far tonight. Now I want to introduce you to the panel. We've got a, a very good group of people to help us figure this all out. We have New York Times columnist Nick Kristoff. We have Lieutenant Colonel Rick Francona, CNN military analyst and a former air attache in Damascus who traveled extensively uh, in Syria as an observer of the country's air defense and military operations. Fran Townsend, CNN's national security analyst and a member of both the DHS and CIA external advisory boards. And Mr. Philip, help me say your last name the right way. Gorevich? Yeah. I've been mangling it for years and I apologize for that. All right. Staff writer for, for the New Yorker. Since one thing we got settled tonight, good. And we're going to have Mr. Newt Gingrich, former Speaker of the House and co-host of CNN's Crossfire. Uh, it's good to have you with us as always, Newt. Um, I want to start off with one quick question. Fran, help me with this. You, you've been guiding me through situations for a long time. The idea that intelligence is not fact. To hear that said to the American people, 
to hear that the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, which we don't even like in criminal trials, let alone we're deciding the bomb, surprising to you. It, it, it is, and I think that it was said both by Secretary Rumsfeld and Tony Blinken not very well, frankly. So there are assessments, those aren't facts, but we know some facts which are based on science. We know chemical weapons were used. The British came out, they identified it as sarin gas. We know it killed people. We know from the intelligence that where it was fired from and the method of delivery. So there so are a lot of facts. Intelligence still means that you know something. That's it right. It still means that. We that's can take right. some comfort in that. That's exactly right. Because that's not right. what Mr. Rumsfeld said. No, that's right. That's but not what are... Mr. Blinken was prepared to say. Right. There are some facts that have been established so far. It may not have persuaded some of the people in the audience, some members of Congress, but there are some facts that we do know. Okay. Now. So assuming we can make, we, assuming the case is made for the American people, that the intelligence is there, that those are facts, that these were chemical weapons, and that they were fired, used by the Assad regime against these innocent people. That's one part. The second part is, is whether or not this plan makes sense. Now, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to go to a member of the Pentagon, a spokesperson for them, and he is going to answer the question of what the plan is and why it makes sense. And we'll take more questions from you. Stay with us. doesn't understand what going to war means and and we don't want to go to war we don't believe we are going to war in the classic sense of taking American troops and America to war all right that was Secretary of State John Kerry testifying before Congress I am Chris Cuomo in for Piers Morgan nobody wants American boots on the ground in Syria that's what seems to be one reality but how can that actually be prevented and guaranteed as such? What exactly does a limited yet effective strike in Syria look like? For some answers, joining us now, Mr. George Little, Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs in the Department of Defense. Thank you very much, Mr. Little, for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Great to be here. Help us with this first point of confusion, the idea of intelligence giving certainty of the situation. Can you tell the American people that you have no doubt about chemical weapons being used and that they were used by the Assad regime? Is your basis for attack solid? Chris, uh, our basis for what might be a military operation is absolutely solid. This is a common sense case, not just from our intelligence, but from public images. The camera uh, footage and the photographs that are coming out of Syria, we know this was a chemical attack. We know that it was perpetrated by the Assad regime. It's deplorable behavior, and we're not alone in that assessment. The British, the French, and others have pinned the rose on the Syrian regime, and uh, we're very confident in the facts that we have developed. All right, let's move on to this second point, the plan for the attack. Obviously, you cannot give us details. We don't expect them, but just in terms of the strategy, it seems to send mixed messages to many people. You're going to bomb, but you don't want to topple the regime. Uh, we're hearing reports from ABC News that now there's an expectation of a larger scale to this than originally thought. What can you tell us? Let me be very clear about what this is and what it isn't. This is about defending an international norm against the use of chemical weapons against innocent populations. That's what this is about. And the president has directed us to plan for a limited operation, limited duration, limited scope, and no boots on the ground. We're not talking about an Iraq or Afghanistan style war. We do have a broader policy in place to bring about regime change. And we're working through other means to do that. We're using the diplomatic track. The State Department is doing an outstanding job working to build a moderate opposition that is more cohesive, that can build a reconciliation process and help the Syrian people to find a path for themselves that does not involve Bashar al-Assad's brutal regime. That's what we're doing. Are you ready if there is a counterattack by Syria, or if Hezbollah decides to do something, or if Iran decides to do something? Do you have plans for those contingencies that would not involve boots on the ground? We are absolutely clear-eyed, and we've been planning ourselves and with our partners, uh, particularly in the region, uh, Turkey and Israel and Jordan and others. We understand that we can never take the risk down to zero, but we believe that we can take steps to mitigate those risks, and that has factored squarely into our planning. Do you want regime change right now? 
This military operation is focused on the objective of deterring and degrading the Syrian regime's ability to use chemical weapons. And that's what this debate is about. Of course we want regime change at the end of the day, but this question that we're debating as a nation right now is about chemical weapons and whether or not we're going to stand up against their indiscriminate use by a brutal regime. What do you feel that the strongest mandate is for this to be the United States in an operation that seems largely solo in a practical sense right now, not having the UN with you, not having NATO with you, not having the bigger allies with you? What gives you the mandate to go it alone? I think the mandate for this is uh, very clear. There is a clearly established international norm against chemical weapons. It is as simple as that, Chris. And many countries around the world have come out and rejected what the Syrian regime has done and condemned the regime for their actions. This is uh, about standing up for uh, that norm, and uh, we believe that it's uh, rooted in the legitimacy of uh, what the international community accepts as responsible behavior. Uh, and we expect uh, the Syrian regime to stop their use of chemical weapons, and uh, we should send a clear message that uh, what they did uh, last month was absolutely intolerable and wrong. Mr. Little, let me let you go with this question. At this point, what do you think it's going to cost? We're uh, working through that right now. We're going to consult with Congress. Uh, this is not a protracted military operation, uh, so we're not looking at tens and tens of billions of dollars here. Uh, this is, uh, even in a fiscally constrained environment, this is a military operation that we could undertake uh, responsibly and at relatively low cost. Which would be? I don't have those figures uh, at hand right now. It depends on uh, the precise parameters of the military operation that uh, we undertake. Uh, the president has not decided uh, to do that yet. So I can't put a uh, precise uh, cost on this, uh, but uh, we believe that uh, it's achievable. And at the end of the day, this is about the national security interests of the United States. If we allow Saddam, or excuse me, Bashar al-Assad to use chemical weapons, then uh, we're uh, truly uh, setting a bad standard and we're putting our forces in harm's way because they could be confronting chemical weapons in the future. All right, Mr. Little, thank you very much for the perspective. I appreciate it. Thank you, Good night. Um, okay, uh, we're gonna come to the panel now and I wanna do it motivating with a question from the audience. Uh, Toby. Toby Goldstein, you ready? What do you uh, uh, Yes, my name is Toby. Um, I'm a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom and a student at Columbia University. Um, uh, we learned a lot of hard lessons uh, in those early years of Iraq. Should this end up being a prolonged conflict, um, uh, how do you think we can avoid making some of the same mistakes we made early in that war? All right, now I'm going to direct this to you, Rick. Thank you for the question, Toby. Uh, I guess the, the, the first one should be that uh, we shouldn't call Assad... Saddam, That's a good right? <laughs> uh, because it does kind of bring back some memories uh, yeah. for American people and people all around the world. But please lay it out for us, Rick. This is serious. And how do you see this in a best case scenario? Well, the best case scenario is we'd be able to do something uh, all standoff, uh, you know, using cruise missiles, maybe air launch cruise missiles, but uh, keep out of Syrian airspace. Uh, if you look at the resolution, it's, it's written in such a way that there's no way to preclude uh, actually flying over Syria. And uh, what I didn't hear in all of this so far is what is the actual objective of this operation? Now, is that unusual that you well, wouldn't have heard that at uh, yes, this point? Yeah, normally what happens is uh, the president defines an objective and he tells the Pentagon, here's what I want uh, to happen. And then the Pentagon decides what weapons they're going to use, how they're going to do it. They determine the, the strategy and tactics. And then he approves it and they do it. Uh, now what they're being told is you're going to use cruise missiles. Oh, and uh, because of the way the resolution's written, there's now reports that may be B-2s, B-52s in a standoff mode. But I can tell you, if the goal is to uh, hit these high-value assets, the delivery systems, the Scud missiles, uh, cruise missiles, air launch cruise missiles are not going to do it. You need penetrating weapons, and that means aircraft over so, Syria. So play off, Rick. Show us on the map, you guys. Like, what could you do? Forget about the doubts. Let's just say everything works perfectly. What would you do here that would achieve the goals as they've been stated so far, that you're going to stop the ability to use chemical weapons, deter anybody else from wanting to try it, um, but not topple the regime and not hurt anybody that you don't want to? Well, Chris, I actually think it's more confused than Rick has suggested. In the interview with George Little, he says the military strategy is as you described, that is to deter and degrade the ability to use chemical weapons. The State Department, that's another agency of the same government, their, their policy, their strategy is regime change. 
And what nobody seems to be able to, to explain to any of us is how are these two things linked? Well, Nick, why don't you get in on that? Because, yeah, you know, so, frankly, I've been following yeah. your work for a lot of years. You're a mentor for me in the business. And when you started making statements that, hey, this may be necessary, sure. why? Why? Well, I mean, a couple of thoughts. First of all, uh, I think there is very little chance we're going to send aircraft over uh, Syria, really for the reason that then we have to take out the air defenses uh, first. And I just don't think that's going to be in the cards. I think we're going to do things either from uh, destroyers offshore or uh, from aircraft uh, standing offshore okay. uh, to, so as not to deal with the aircraft. I think that the parallel of this is probably something like Operation Desert Fox in uh, 1998, which is a three-day campaign against uh, Saddam's Iraq. There's a debate about whether or not it accomplished very much. Um, some think it did, some think it didn't, but it wasn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, it wasn't anything like Iraq. Uh, and, um, you know, I guess where I come down on this is that I think we're very much focused reasonably on the risks of intervention and that sound. We have to be prudent about it. But there are also real risks of not getting involved. We have to think about alternatives. Representative Hahn talked about, well, we should go instead to the United Nations and seek multilateral ventures. That sounds great, but we have tried that approach. And 100,000 people have died as a result. 60,000 people at this rate are dying each year. Uh, we have seen this escalation of chemical attacks. And so I think the question becomes, you know, what are our alternatives? And given those, it seems to me that firing uh, some cruise missiles from offshore to try to deter the chance that chemical weapons are going to be used again seems to be a less worse alternative than all the others. All right, so we're going to take a break here. We're going to come back on this question of explaining to people how that will be accomplished, how you'll stop chemical weapons by using bombs, and the regional fallout that we're worried about. We're going to pick it up right there, and we're also going to bring in Mr. Gingrich, because I don't want him waiting out there too long, and we're going to ask him about what we've learned from the past and what the best course forwards is. Stay with us. everybody, I'm Chris Cuomo, in for Piers Morgan. We have right now with me, starting from my left, Nick Kristoff, Rick Francona, Fran Townsend, and Philip... Give me again. Gravich. Gravich. That's the one thing I want you to take away from tonight, is the right way to say his name, and he is worth knowing his name right. Uh, we're taking your questions as well. Uh, tonight we have Newt Gingrich joining us as well. Let's start off here quickly with a show of hands. From what we've heard so far, a uh, show of hands, people who are more confident that the plan is in place, the intelligence is in place, that the best option uh, to help the people in Syria right now is to bomb. Show of hands. All right, let's continue with the conversation. Let's uh, get a question. Nada, Nada, do you have a question for yes, us? Yes, I do. Please. So my question is now that we've clearly established that this is about international norms and the use of chemical weapons, the United States used napalm and white phosphorus in Iraq. Are we really the country to take the moral high road on Assad's use of chemical weapons? All right, Mr. Gingrich. Now what's the end game? Thank you. Mr. Gingrich, uh, let's bring you in here, Newt, from the perspective of, uh, you know, you heard Nada's question. What is the end game? And please give us some perspective on how you think the White House has handled it so far. Well, frankly, I'm opposed to this campaign uh, for partially the purpose, that, the point she made. Um, we've had 100,000 people killed in Syria so far. We've had lots of children killed. These are tragedies. Uh, we've also had tragedies around the world, in Darfur, in Rwanda, in West Africa. Uh, I don't agree with the president's comment in, in Sweden the other day that we're the world's 911. And I think that we ought to be very careful about the projects we undertake. I can't imagine a, a limited campaign, and Secretary Hagel yesterday in the House testimony said it would only cost tens of millions. That's a direct quote, tens of millions. Well, a Tomahawk missile costs about a million dollars. So if it's in the tens of millions, we're talking about 30, 40, 50 missiles uh, against a regime which has, by the way, been in power since 1970. Uh, his father took over in 1970, 43 years ago. Uh, it just strikes me that we're in the middle of a public relations effort. It makes no sense. You saw Secretary of Kerry and the Senate committee start by saying no boots on the ground, then answer a question by describing boots on the ground, then retract boots on the ground and say, gee, I was just thinking out loud. I don't get a lot of confidence okay, when the Secretary of the State 
uh, thinks out loud about a war. All right, thank you for that part of it. Um, Nick, give me the other side. Yeah, can I just address Nia's question? I think it's an important one. And, you know, it is true that we have violated human rights. So why should we be telling other countries that? We have used napalm. So why should, what right do we have to talk about napalm in Syria? And I guess the argument I would make is that it's important, it's all the more important to raise human rights issues abroad. Because we had Jim Crow laws in the American South and we're violating the, the rights of black Americans does not mean we should not have, uh, have kept quiet about the Holocaust. Um, and it is better to inconsistently stand up, sometimes hypocritically stand up and save some lives than to consistently save none. Philip, let me ask you a question. And also, there's the question of who we will wind up helping here. The New York Times is going to have a cover where there are Syrian soldiers, uh, apparently, laid out, and they're being shot by rebels. It's today's paper. We're looking at it right now. Here's the cover. Um, the question is, who winds up being benefited by this? Who takes over? Do you improve the situation? Are you helping al-Qaeda? Are you having extremist elements? Control, what about that part? Well, that gets to the obvious question that we don't know why this is being done. There's no stated intended outcome. We know all about these unintended consequences being thrown around. What are the intended consequences? How do we want this to end? I, I, over a year and a half ago, when the, when the death toll was about, or around a year and a half ago, when it was at about 10,000, uh, there was a G8 meeting at Camp David. The Russians said, you know, there's one inevitable question. After Assad, who do you want there? And we've never had an answer to that. And that goes to the fact that we don't have an answer to what we're trying to do here. And uh, when, when Nick starts to say, uh, we have to hold up these international norms, we have to stand up for human rights, but then he immediately is talking about 60,000 a year if we stand by. He's talking about the larger war. You're not talking about limited right. strikes then. Well, and, and everybody is talking about the larger war. There's a deep confusion in this debate about what the objectives are within the administration, within the selling of it to Congress, within the press discussion of it. And I think that we don't know who we'd be supporting here. We're not comfortable with the uh, rebels. There's... John McCain says he does know them. He is comfortable with it. And he knows he's going to take Oh, no, it's a, it's a yeah, serious point. The senator went there. Like, he visited his iPad and saying that he doesn't take the, that he doesn't listen to the Joint Chiefs of Staff Chief anymore. The, Newt, you're laughing. Help me out here. And say, um, the, the poker aside, Senator John McCain knows the situation as well as anybody. He's been on the ground. Uh, what is your take on that, Newt? I think anybody who thinks that an American politician, even one as experienced as John McCain, has any deep understanding of the hatreds, the rivalries, the clan violence, uh, the religious uh, conflicts that make a place like Syria operate, uh, is, is rejecting all the evidence we have for the last 15 years. Uh, we occupied and totally dominated Iraq. We could not pacify it. Uh, we have blown apart the Gaddafi dictatorship. Libya is a mess. Uh, we are unable to completely pacify Afghanistan. Uh, Syria is a very complicated country with a lot of people who hate each other. And the idea that they've been kept relatively peaceful until two years ago because the Assad regime was so consistently brutal. Uh, the idea that we're going to go in and we're going to cleverly find the right people denies everything we've learned in the last 15 years about the Middle East. But we do know something about the rebels. I mean, every journalist who goes into Syria, uh, including me, finds rebels to work with. And you're betting your life on finding the right rebels. And the fact that there are so many journalists going in means that, for the most part, people do find rebels who they can trust. You know, it's difficult, it's complex, there have been some tragic mistakes, uh, but it's not a completely black box there. All right, so hold that point right there. We're going to go to break. Uh, Mr. Gingrich, thank you very much for joining us. Thank Everybody you. else, please stay here. Uh, when we come back, I want to know if you think President Obama has tripped over his own red line. We're going to take more questions from the audience and get your take from the next question. When we come back. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Chris Cuomo, and for Piers Morgan, back with me, Nick Kristoff, Lieutenant Colonel Rick Francona, Fran Townsend, the man who's only known as Philip now, <laughs> Philip Gorovich. It's great to have you all with us. Uh, also, joining us in the audience tonight, we have a lot of people who are from Syria. Show of hands for people who are of Syrian descent. Okay, I want to go back to what was in the New York Times, the cover. Uh, it, I apologize, difficult for you to see, difficult for everybody to see. Here's what we understand about the situation. The men standing are rebel fighters. The men on the ground, uh, shirtless, are Syrian um, members of the Syrian army. They are being used as an example. There's video as well. I want to play you a little of it so you can understand the situation. It's tough to look at. You will not see 
uh, the actual violence that takes place, but you will hear it. Here it is. The short description is that the rebel is saying, you're going to take our blood, we're going to take yours as well. And they then execute uh, the men on the ground and put their bodies, we believe, in an unmarked grave, which we believe was a well. Now, Nick, this is horrible. We know that. Uh, it's your paper, and it raises the question, who will be helped in this situation? These are the rebels, supposedly. These are the people we want to help. Help explain the situation. I mean, there's no question that there are many rebel groups, um, particularly some of the jihadis in the north, that have engaged in all kinds of atrocities, and it's inexcusable. Um, you know, I think that one of the what really sad things about watching Syria over the last two and a half years has been that there has been, uh, that as more people have been killed, everybody has become uh, more full of hatred, more poisonous toward every other group. And the, there's been a real radicalization uh, of all kinds of, of rebel groups. So, Philip, how do we know who to help? I don't think we do. I think it's quite clear that we don't know at this point who we want to help. I think that when, when you see the paralysis that uh, has defined uh, the Obama administration's Syria policy all this time, it's that we don't know. And, and the red line, uh, you know, we always talk about when, when, they, when they go to sell something like this, everybody says, well, we're not going to take options off the table down the road. Nobody ever wants to take an option off the table. What the red line did is it took off the table the option of not having to bomb. Not being, it basically put him in this corner where now he feels he has to be seen uh, responding to the use of chemical weapons. And basically, so far, the biggest rationale is that we cannot not do something. Fran and then Rick weigh in on this for also from the perspective of the basis of the argument that Phillips making just because it may have been a political statement that was made that was wise or unwise why is the justification justification for it have to be bombing well and I think you've seen now over the last several days the president's walked back from his original language well it's not my red line it's the international community's red line and, and it's Congress's red line and it's everybody's right the president really doesn't want this to be about his political statement there are international norms about the, uh, prohibiting the proliferation and use of chemical weapons because it was tragically 1,000, 1,500 in the August attack. That was not the first attack. There have been dozens of other uses of chemical mm -hmm. weapons inside Syria. And by the way, as tragic as the August 21st large-scale use of chemical weapons was, the, the ability of chemical weapons to be used to kill 10,000 or 50,000 is not out of the question. And so that's what the president's trying to prevent. Rick, what is the chance that this can be quick on the military level and then unpacking what happens with the fallout? Well, depending on what we want to do. If you want to deter him from using chemical weapons, we may have already done that by having this conversation. Uh, by, by the president uh, and, and uh, raising awareness could, could have achieved that goal. But I don't think we can get away with just that. So I think we're going to be forced into something. But... Uh, and I think they're trying to walk back what the expectations are going to be because, and what are the objectives going to be. Because if you go in there in a meaningful way, you will be helping uh, the opposition. And, and as Philip was saying, the opposition isn't a monolithic organization. There's probably hundreds of groups out there who have uh, competing interests. And they only work with each other when they have a, a mutual goal. And then they go back to being uh, on their own. And sometimes they're against the, themselves. We could, we could be setting up the second civil war of Syria. Chris, right. I think it's worth yes, saying quickly that, that even if you accept that there are facts, that there were chemical weapons used and it was the Assad regime, what the, what the administration and the president have not done a very good job at making the case is why is this in America's national interest? And I think that's why you see a lack of support on both sides. So of the that's aisle. the question I put to you. We're going to talk about it after the break. Please tweet us. You can do it at Chris Cuomo. You can use the hashtag about the town hall tonight. You'll see it online. We're going to be right back. Stay with us. We have Fran Townsend, we have Colonel Rick Francona, and Mr. Nick Kristoff joining us here. Uh, we also have a really great studio audience. A lot of members here are uh, of Syrian extract. They have family there, and we want to talk and hear their perspective as well. Uh, and we're going to start with that. We have Tom in the audience, right? Tom, please. You have, uh, you're, you're from Syria, yes? And what is your take on the situation? What do you want to say? Well, what I 
I want to say is that we want to show the other side of the story. Uh, Syrians are seeing new faces. Uh, they're seeing people with beard killing people, civilians, eating litters, uh, forcing uh, archbishops and Christians to convert into Islam. Hold on, Tom. They're not hearing you. We're hearing you, but they're not hearing you at home. We're going to get you a better mic. They're going to get you a better microphone. So let's hold on one second while we're getting Tom. Let's try this microphone, see if this works better. So as a... Uh, it's got to be better. <laughs> as a Syrian-American, where Syrians are seeing uh, terrorists, new faces, new languages, people with beard, they're killing Christians, uh, forcing uh, archbishops to, to, you know, to convert into Islam. Uh, they're eating livers, uh, um, you know, they're threatening people, asking for ransoms. Uh, there are new faces from Afghanistan, from Libya, from Chechen. They're same people that we saw in the Boston bombing. Um, same people responsible, we're seeing them in Syria. And we want to show the American and the world the other side of the story that is not being covered. We are happy with our regime. We've been very happy with it. We were living in a perfect harmony, Christian, Jews, and Muslims, and atheists. Um, so, Tom, you're saying you support the Assad regime? 100%. And I think it's our right. It's our right to decide our future. It's our right to decide our regime. It's not, it's no one's business well, to decide. Tom, that, it is an important point that's somewhat neglected in the debate that we're having in this country right now is the assumption that everybody wants change. I mean, but if President Assad thought that the majority of people would support him, he would have an election. And there's... Yeah. Can you just say something real quick? Um, Hosni Mubarak, Egyptian president, fell down after a month and a half. Libyan president after a couple of months. Uh, certainly Tunisia and all the other countries. Syrian president has been almost three years after what's happening. It's not as uh, Arabic spring that's, you know, affecting. It's uh, Arabic fall that's falling on us because all the negative all the impact that is affecting the Syrians. Tom, um, thank you very much for the thank perspective. You. Appreciate it. There is no doubt that there, is, that there are significant communities uh, within Syria that uh, support the president. I mean, the Alawi community, a uh, great portion of the Christian community uh, supports President Assad. Uh, there's also you know, no doubt that the majority of the country is Sunni and um, is very unhappy with Assad and would, that he would lose a free election. He is Sunni, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm Sunni, yeah. and uh, I'm, my whole family actually lives in Syria, and I can guarantee that Bashar al-Assad does have support, the support, you know, the bombing. But, but obviously, he, right, if he really had support broadly in the country, then he would not need to use guns, he could use ballots. All right, Nick, let's continue this conversation in the break. We're going to come back with more from the audience right after this. <laughs> Thank all of you for all the great questions online. Let's keep that dialogue going just like we've had here. I want to thank the panel. We have Philip Gubrevich. I forget, I'll never get it right. For Fran Townsend, uh, Rick Francona, thank you very much. And Nick Christoph. thank you for the panel. Thank you for the members of the audience. Appreciate all the great questions. I hope the town hall was a benefit to you. Let's turn it over to Anderson Cooper right now. His show starts right now. See you on New Day. Good evening, everyone. We begin tonight with